You're listening to episode number seven of the Momotion Podcast. My name is Maureen Holohan. I'm a former college and pro basketball player turned writer, entrepreneur, and director of Momotion in New York City. At Momotion, we focus on providing you with the best information regarding youth basketball and young athlete development. Today's guest is Dr. Gregory D. Felice, a former Princeton football and inner rugby play- rugby player. Doc started his medical career working as a trauma surgeon in the ER. Now he is a fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports traumatology and joint reconstruction surgery at Hospital for Special Surgery and New York Presbyterian Hospital. Doc's son is in our youth basketball program in Manhattan. One day after practice last spring, he started telling me about his new ACL repair surgery that he was practicing and the remarkable results he was getting from his patients. I replayed to him all the hardship and struggle after tearing my ACL in Long Island my senior year of high school and trying to come back five weeks later, only to tear it again in front of 5,000 fans in the final game of my high school career. I still remember the pop and my reaction as well as the reaction of other players, coaches, and fans who saw it happen to me. I've also seen other athletes tear their ACL, and when I do, I feel sick all over again. I told Doc how much I was concerned about the growing population of young players who are suffering from ACL tears and reconstructions at an early age, and how I often wonder if they're strong enough and lucky enough to make it back. Doc said something I've always been too tough or too proud to admit. The ACL reconstruction surgery is a really hard surgery on the knee, on the body, and on the mind. The failure rate for athletes is high due mostly to the post-op atrophy, nerve damage, changes in proprioception, and difficulty in returning to full range of motion, which often can set up other injuries. Over the years, studies and reports have shown that girls and women are seven to eight times more likely to blow up their ACL than their male counterparts. Overall, it is estimated that about 300,000 athletes a year tear their ACL in the U.S. alone. Dr. DeFelice believes that 80,000 of these athletes with proximal tears, which are clean tears right off the bone, are the right fit for the smaller repair surgery over a full reconstruction. In this episode, you will learn the failure rate on ACL reconstructions is 20%. A survey in Canada reported that one-third of the athletes studied tore the other ACL ligament in the other knee or retore the reconstructed one. You'll also learn when ACL reconstructions are the only option and instances where the repair surgery that gets the athlete back in half the time is the risk worth taking. Dr. DeFelice has 90% success rate on his ACL repair surgeries. His surgery is supporting the beliefs that less is more and the body wants to heal. I'm grateful that my outstanding surgeon, Dr. Alford from Albany, New York, many years ago made me sit out the full nine months after he reconstructed my knee. I'm grateful that Northwestern and the coaching staff did not rush me back too soon and they allowed me to register my freshman year. And now I'm grateful to know that there is a more optimistic option for many athletes who suffer an injury that is ending too many athletic careers. And now onto the interview with Dr. Greg DeFelice of the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. I thought we had this problem licked. I thought the surgical treatment, I thought that the outcomes were awesome and that everybody got back, but that's really not the case, you know? And so what happens is, is the outcomes of surgery are really are heavily skewed depending on the age, right? So unfortunately, in the younger patients, like 21 and below, the failure rate of surgery is almost 20%. And this is the reconstructive surgery? This is the big surgery, the reconstructive surgery. The failure is 20%. 20%. There's just a recent study out of Canada that's, that looked at 100 girls, soccer players, age 18 and below, that showed that within a two-year time period after surgery, a third of them had either retorn their that leg, their knee that was operated on or torn the other knee. So, you know, there's, there's just gigantic problems. It, it, we haven't got the problem solved, especially in the younger age groups. And the other problem with the surgery is that it it's a big surgery, and it, and it requires a big recovery. It takes people almost, we, most doctors recommend that you wait a year until you go back to play now. So I was a, a senior in high school at Troy High. We had been invited to the Christ the King tournament, which was a big deal. We were nationally ranked. We had won the state championship. I had signed with Northwestern on November 7th. It was December 27th, and I was in the Christ the King tournament. And I'm only mentioning that because back then, you tore out your knee and you tore your knee up and you were, you were done. And that's basically what happened. I, I went 
for a loose ball. I went for a steal and the, I set up the steal. It went the other way. My knee stayed and it popped and everybody heard it. And it was shocking. And everyone started crying and was like, they've never seen anything like that. And the girl who threw me the pass through the pass and the other team sent me a card, like for the next 12 months, every month she would send me a card. She felt so awful because she saw my knee go. And the first person who came up to me was the coach from Christ the King. And he was the first person to me. And he said, that's too bad, Maureen. You would have been a great player. So can you imagine being 17, you're thinking you're going to play college ball, you're going to defend your state title, and hearing that you're done. So they wheeled me to an emergency room. I knew right away it was bad because it blew up. So yeah. it was like a bowling ball. Sure, and my sure. dad's like, you can play on that. And I'm like, Dad, I can't even move. So from there, it was five to six weeks. My The doctor I saw, and this is what we can talk about, is Dr. Furlong said, I don't want to evaluate this. I'm going to pass it to Dr. Alfred, who was one of the first doing the reconstructions 25 years ago. Right. And he said to me, you, you can go back and try to play on it halfway torn. And he, he told me I could. And, of course, I was determined to defend the state title. The first game back, it was wobbly, but my team was really good, so I could hide behind it. Second game back, it was giving out warm-ups. Somehow made it through. And then the Shenandoah game, I knew... I knew it was going to, I couldn't, I couldn't get through warm. I start within two minutes. I just fall over. Right. So that whole progression of, okay, you're never going to play again. Okay. You can try to go play on it. And now where we are, where it seems as though college scouts and, and recruits, if a girl blows their knee before signing, they will still take a chance on her because it's so common now. So what has happened over the last 20, 25 years with this surgery and the success rates back then versus now and where you fall in all of this? Well, we've learned a heck of a lot more since those days, right? Back then, you know, that's not a heck of a lot past when Joe Namath blew his knee and was like the first guy to ever get back. In the beginning, way back when, they initially started to try and stitch the ligament back together. Like, if you think of the ACL like a rope that connects your two bones together and it keeps your shin bones stuck under your thigh bone, when you tear it, when you felt that pop, the one that everybody knows, that's the ligament rupturing. You exceeded the strength of the ligament. Sometimes that ligament pops right off the bone and detaches, or sometimes it rips in the middle. And what they used to do is cut your knee open, they try and stitch it back together and put you in a cast. And then they found out after following those patients that about 50% of them failed. They gave up on that, and they came upon uh, or adopted what we call reconstruction. That's the modern-day approach to the ACL surgery. And essentially what ACL reconstruction does is we attempt to replace the old ligament with a new graft, okay? So we'll go into your knee with the arthroscope now. We have the fancy scope that we can stick in through little incisions, and we look inside your knee, and we resect all the torn ligament. So now you have an empty space, and we know where it starts and where it finishes, so we drill holes there, and we place a graft in there. Most everybody knows that it's either your hamstring tendon or part of your patella tendon, Occasionally, we'll use parts from a dead person called an allograph, but we put that in there, and then we lock it in with screws or buttons. Your body has no idea what's happening. It just freaks out and knows that something's wrong, and it starts to heal. And as it heals, it attacks that graft and hopefully turns it into scar tissue. So essentially, the, what reconstruction attempts to do is trick your body into making a new ligament out of scar tissue that uses the graft as a scaffolding. That is what reconstruction is. Okay? But there's a lot of issues with that. Now, it does work, and it works pretty darn well, and we can get a good number of people back to a, a nice firm knee, and that's steady that you can play on. We've all seen the pro athletes who make it back and do tremendous things. We all know college and high school athletes who've done it, even recreational athletes. But there's a lot of holes in that, and it's not a perfect operation. So by any stretch, twenty percent failure rate. Well, it take you now. You have to view all of this with a trained eye. Okay, if you look overall at ACL reconstruction and the outcomes and how well people do, there's probably an overall a five to ten percent failure rate. However, if you divide the patients by age group, the youngest patients, like say age under twenty one, their failure rate approaches almost twenty percent. And if you divide it girls to boys, the girls are even higher. And the reasons why? Well, you know, it's it's really hard to pinpoint. If you take patients who are 30 and over, their failure rate's probably less than 5%. 
And the dividing line is probably around 25 years of age. Now, some people argue that it's the nuances of, you know, the younger patient, etc. Personally, I think it's the younger patients are putting more stress on that knee and they're testing our ligament far more than the older patients do. Most people, when they get to about 25, realize, well, if I toured playing soccer, maybe I should just stop playing soccer. <laughs> right. And so you downshift your life so that you're not putting as much stress on your knee so this reconstruction can last longer. So the young people don't do that. They go immediately back to high-level sports and try and you know push this thing as hard as it's going to go. And I think what they're really showing us is the limitations of our reconstruction. The native ACL ligament is a very, very complex structure. We talk about it as one rope that connects the two bones, but in reality, it's probably more like several hundred little ropes that connect the bones at all different angles. And when we do our graft, we just make one strip, one rope of scar tissue that connects it from point A to point B. With screws. Yep, screws or buttons, it's a, but it's essentially scar tissue. It's held in by screws. Right. That just holds the graft in place while the body turns it to scar tissue. But in reality, if we were making a truly anatomic ligament, we would put in many, many different grafts at multiple different angles. And for a while in the mid-2000s, we started to do, instead of a single bundle ACL reconstruction, we started to do what was called a double bundle ACL reconstruction to try and at least make the two main bundles of the ligament that was led by a guy named Freddie Fu in Pittsburgh. However, what happened was is that that surgery was technically too complicated. And so we found that a lot, we couldn't prove that it was much better than the single bundle. But what the surgeons knew was that it was much harder than the single bundle. And when it didn't work, you'd already burned a lot of bridges. So people reverted back to doing a single bundle reconstruction. Okay, so as it pertains to kids, which is our audience here, We've gone from this big scar down your knee to repairing it 25 years ago to taking the patellar or the graft from the cadaver and threading it through. And now you're saying that's way too much impact on the body and it's putting the kid at risk of stressing it out too much all over again? Well, it's not so much that, but it, what it is is it doesn't always work. There's a failure rate. And even if you go in and you do a good graft and, and you put it in and everything should work, still 15, 20% of the kids are failing. And, what, and they're re-rupturing it. I definitely saw this happen. It didn't happen to me. And the number one reason I credit how hard I rehabbed. Mm -hmm. And number two, my doctor, after he let me try to come back, he brought me into surgery and he said, you are going to listen to everything I say and you're not coming back a day before nine months. At the time, a lot of people were pushing six months, seven months. And I also redshirted my freshman year at Northwestern. Sure, sure. So there was no urgency to come back by October 15th. I That's came fair. back on December 9th. My coaches were fine. They said, use your red shirt year, take your time. Whereas other kids who have this time element, which is exactly why it, there's a strong case for your surgery. If they want to come back in three to four to six months, they don't have nine months to a year to wait. You're really not ready. See, the trouble with the full reconstruction is, and let me also caveat that by saying the allograft we tend to use for older folks. We, we try not to use allograft on the young kids. Because, the, again, in the, in the research, the studies show that the, the allografts fail at a higher rate in the younger folks. So we tend to use either the hamstring tendon or the patella tendon. But the trouble is we still have this failure rate. And one of the things is, and it's a very complicated topic, one of the things is, is that when you chop out the old ACL that's torn up, you've taken out all of the nerve endings. So when your brain calls your knee and says, hello, knee, what are you doing down there? It gets a, an empty signal. It doesn't connect to your knee because all the nerves are gone. So it takes time for the body to kind of reconnect as to how to speak to the knee. Whereas my surgery is completely different. I saved the entire ligament. So the people feel normal almost instantaneously because we just keep all the native ligament. We just reattach it. Well, for me, it, the biggest thing is I couldn't feel the front of where this, the scar was. So I lost my feeling in the incision. And then second, my range of motion is still not the same. Right. So well, I'll get to that. So the surgery, the reconstruction is a big surgery. People have a hard time getting their range of motion back. As you just mentioned, you still don't even have full range of motion. People, their thigh muscle atrophies so that when you look at them, you, their operative leg is half the size of their other leg. And that takes months and months, if not years to get back. So when you say that people went back at six months and they retore their ligament, 
it probably wasn't an indictment of the ligament reconstruction, but it was the fact that their leg was dyskinetic. It, dis it wasn't working normally. They didn't have normal strength. They didn't have normal what we call proprioception or a sense of where your leg is in space. So nothing was normal about it. Yeah, the knee might have been stable, but now when you went to run around, you were favoring the other leg. You, you, know, you weren't ready to go. We've learned a lot since then, and even with the major reconstructions, we tend to wait much longer, kind of like you did because of the redshirt year. So we'll wait nine months to a year almost routinely for these kids to get their, their muscles back and their sense of proprioception so that they can move better. They don't go back too soon. And in fact, a lot of the, the higher level places like here at the Hospital for Special Surgery would try and have people go back and get a functional movement assessment where we watch you with high-speed photography doing cuts and jumps and pivots to see exactly how normalized your motion is. And if you think you're moving normal because you feel pretty good, wait until we watch you on a high-speed photography camera, and then you can see everything slow down, like, you know, like they do on TV. And you can see the nuances of how you're not really moving normally. You're moving well, but you're not normal. And so we may hold the kid or do some extra exercises to make it so they are moving normally. Well, plus there's the mental issue. Like I was awful for a good month and a half. And then I went home. Well, it was about a three, three or four weeks. I went home for Christmas break and my little brother beat me in a game of one-on-one -on -one, and he told everyone in our town. Right, right. And then for some reason, I just decided like I had to mentally get over the fear of it happening again. Oh man, you're not kidding. So look, I, I'm not unlike you, right? So I played college football at Princeton. 1980, 88 was my senior year. When I was a junior, I played with the 1987 team and I... I can't remember the exact exact numbers, but I think we lost seven out of 11 starters on the defensive team to ACL injuries. I lived it, and then I played rugby forever. I played basketball. I ski. So these, these injuries, if you're an athlete, everyone knows people, if not yourself, who's had endless numbers of ACL injuries. And so when I went out into practice and started practicing, I was extremely frustrated. It's kind of funny, the story, how it goes. I, I originally started practicing... I became the chief of, of a big city hospital, the chief of sports medicine and, and joint reconstructive surgery at a big city hospital called Jacoby in the Bronx. And what I was seeing was not so many, so much athletic population, but I was seeing a trauma population. So I was seeing people who got hit by cars, dislocated their knees. They would have three ligaments out, four ligaments out. And when I did the big surgery to make them better, these people didn't have the insurance or the money or the understanding or the education level to actually get through therapy like you did as a level one, you know, a division one athletic scholarship player. They didn't have all the, the staff around to help you through it. And so what I found was the bigger the surgery I did, the worse the patients did. And I started toying with changing my surgery to minimizing what I was doing to the patient so that they could get through the surgery. And so when I went into the knee and I saw a ligament was torn, if it was torn right off the bone, like detached, I just started to reattach it. I would use some suture anchors like we do in the shoulder for the rotator cuff, and I would tack it back. If it was torn in the middle, then I would replace it with a reconstruction. And what I found was that the patient started to do better because the surgery was smaller and they got their range of motion back faster and it didn't hurt so much. And I kind of knew I was onto something. I started working on the PCL, which is much less commonly injured, but unless you're in a trauma population. And that started to work. And then eventually I saw my first patient with an isolated ACL that was torn off the bone. It was about eight and a half years ago. The patient was 42 years old. He was the CEO of a company. And I said to him, look, he was actually the friend of an orthopedic surgeon who didn't want to operate on his friend, who knew that I did some interesting things and sent him to me to see if he was a candidate. And I took him to, I said, you know, here's the deal. You tore your ligament right off the bone. You detached it from the wall. I said, most everyone in the, is going to tell you that you should reconstruct it. But I do these surgeries where I reattach it with suture anchors. And you have the right type of tear. You have a life to get back to. You're running a company. You got family. You got kids. You got all that stuff. You don't have time for a big, long rehab. I said, let me try and reattach it. If it works, great. You win. You win the jackpot. You get better quicker and it's your native ligament. If you lose and it doesn't work, we can always go do the reconstruction. And he was a thinking man and he said, you know what, doc, go for it. 
because he had had a big surgery on his other knee and it worked like gangbusters. He got better within six weeks. He was running and he never looked back. That was eight and a half years ago. And it took me four years to collect my first 11 patients. And that's because I was being ultra meticulous because I knew the whole orthopedic world was going to tell me that I was crazy. They're going to say, you can't do that. That doesn't work. All the old studies says that you can't repair the ACL. And I said, yeah, but in my experience, you can, but you can only do it for specific types of tears. See, the trouble with the old studies was that they tried to repair every type of tear the same way. So what they would do back when, when they tried to repair the ACL, is they would open up the knee, they would look inside and say, oh, look, the ACL's torn. And they would proceed to try and stitch it back together, whether it was torn off the bone or it was torn in the middle. And then they would put you in a cast up to your hip, which was devastating in and of itself. And then after five years, they checked on all the results, and it was 50% failed and 50% were good. And they looked at the, that and they said, the glass is half empty. Look at this, 50% of the people failed. We can't do this surgery. We need to come up with another surgery. Let's replace it so that something's intact, right? But they never looked at it and said, maybe the glass is half full. What about those 50% of people that did well? What was it about those patients that made it so that they succeeded, but the other people didn't? Well, my research group and myself, we've gone back and looked at every paper ever written in the history of the world on this topic. And we've divided out the papers based upon how the ligament was torn and not just if it was torn. And what we've shown is that once you divide the studies out based upon how the ligament was torn, most of the successful outcomes were clustered in the patients who tore it off the bone, what we call a proximal tear. So it's not that ACL repair doesn't work, it's just that it doesn't work for every type of tear. You follow? I do. I think the biggest thing when I first got my MRI and people do now is they're not sure exactly how bad the tear is or where it is until they go in. Sure, sure. So when you go in, if you realize it's a less than optimal situation, or do you know that beforehand? Oh, that totally. Was... See, what people never did was they just looked at the MRI and said, is it torn? Is it not torn? Because the whole, you got to understand two or three generations of orthopedic surgeons have never thought about repairing the ACL because everyone drank the Kool-Aid that said, it doesn't work, you can't do this, and they moved on. Nobody has thought about this in years, in decades. And you think about it like this. I use these, these analogies all the time for my patients. If you take a horse's tail and you cut it with the scissors right in the middle and you say, go ahead, stitch that back together, everyone is going to stop and say, you can't stitch a horse's tail back together. Come on. But if you pull the horse's tail off, off his bum, then they say, oh, okay, we can pin the tail back on the donkey, right? That makes sense. You can reattach a ligament that's intact, but simply detached. But you can't stitch a ligament back together that's ripped in the middle. And that's what they never realized. So now we've got MRI, right? We've got unbelievably good MRI. So I can tell exactly what type of tear you have before we ever go to surgery. I know because we've just done the study and submitted it for publication. We looked at 350 ACL tears on an MRI, and we know that 16% of them are torn right off the bone. And I know from my practice that 90 to 95% of those types, I can repair primarily with a little surgery. You get better super fast. Then there's the next ones that are close to the wall, within 25% of the bone, but not quite to the bone. 23% of the tears are of that type. And if you have that type of tear, I can repair it 50% of the time. Okay. And, now, and we know that 50% of the tears, the majority, are right in the middle of the ligament, the middle 50%. And those are hard to repair. I can only repair that about 12% of the time. So it's so, good. You'd be able to tell a patient you're in one of these three categories. Like this is, this is what it looks like. Exactly. And then you go in there and you do your work and you hope that they rehab. Or is it just like a fusion where you hope they heal right? Like what are you hoping for? So now when I, when I go into the knee, I go in with the scope and I have a look about. I look at the ligament and I say, okay, the MRI told me it was going to look like this. Let's see what it really looks like. And I take a probe and I poke at it and look at it. And like I said, if it's a type 1 tear right off the bone, 90 to 95% of the time, it's just sitting right there and it looks normal. You That's literally pin it back to where it was. Yeah, so the standard 
orthopedic, surgical, sports medicine community worldwide at that point will say, oh, look, it's torn. You can't repair the ACL. They'll take a shaver and resect the entire ligament. They'll drill holes and they'll put up a graft and then you're on your way down the reconstruction world. What I'll do is I'll take an arthroscopic tool called a uh, scorpion uh, suture passer and it's literally just a stitcher. It allows me to reach into the knee through a small hole and pass a suture and stitch it through the ligament so I grab it like a pair of shoelaces, you could think of it. And then I'll do that for each of the bundles and then I poke a little hole in the wall and I put a little suture anchor in and I attach those shoelaces up to the wall. That essentially anchors the ACL back to where it started from, what's called the origin. It anchors it back to the bone like a tent stake would hold the corner of a tent down. Now think about it. The body has no idea what's going on. It just knows that it's injured, just like when you tore your ACL. It's injured. It will heal, and it will heal right to what's sitting right next to it, which is the bone where it came from. When you tear your ACL, it rips off the bone, and it does what happens to everything. It sags down to gravity. And sometimes it'll scar right to the PCL next to it. That's why some people, they get their knee becomes stable again, because the ligament, even though it's torn, it scars to the one next to it. We even have a bunch of patients who came in anywhere from 5 to 11 years after they tore their ACL because they tore their meniscus and they had knee pain. And I said, look, your ACL was torn all those years ago. It's scarred to the PCL. I can just pick it right off the PCL and reattach it. And there's like, come on, doc, what are you talking about? You, you might as well. You're in you there, right? I'm in there. You got nothing to lose. Let me do it. So we have about seven patients who were anywhere from 5 to 11 years post-injury who came in for a meniscus tear, and I reattached their ACL, and now their knee's stable, and they can play tennis again. No, it's incredible. I think it's a testament to this whole notion that the body wants to heal. You're darn straight it does. It wants to heal everything, and all we got to do is get out of its way and try and let it heal. I, I've had six surgeries, and the first one was my reconstruction. And now looking back, I think it, it set up my other imbalances. Of course it did. So here's, this, here's the unfortunate truth about ACL reconstruction, uh, is that all this time we've been doing ACL reconstruction, and one of the, the thought processes is that if your tire is loose on your car, you need to tighten up the lug nuts, otherwise your tire is not going to last 50,000 miles like a steel belted radial will, right? So all these years we've been doing reconstruction in order to tighten up your knee so that it's not loose so that you don't get arthritis. But the studies are clearly showing that the people who've had ACL reconstruction get more arthritis, right? No, it's not good at all because we've been doing this for about 25 or 30 years exclusively. Now, we don't have studies based upon people for ACL repair for long term as far as arthritis goes, but what we do have is some, some studies where they looked at pigs, where they did differential treatment for a set of uh, pigs. And they did, in one, in one set of pigs, they cut the ACL and left the knee loose. In the other set of pigs, they cut the ACL and stitched it back to the wall. In another set of pigs, they cut the ACL and reconstructed it. The study was done by a, a woman named Martha Murray from Boston. She's also done a lot of research in the area of trying to repair the ACL, although she has a different technique than me. But she's done a lot of research. And this one study on pigs showed that when you follow the pigs out for the long term, the only pigs that didn't get arthritis were the ones who had their ligament repaired, not left alone or not reconstructed. So that's fascinating thing that, and it may, if you intuitively, if you scratch your head and say, yeah, well, if you reattach your ligament, it's kind of basically like back to normal, right? Because it's your ligament and it's just scarred back to the bone. So people come in, you know, I saw 10 patients with an ACL today. About three or four of them were post-op and six of them were new patients. There was a young girl, she was 16, and she was playing volleyball, and she showed me her video on her, on her phone about when she jumped, just like you did, and she came down and her knee buckled. She was tall and lanky, she was probably five foot nine, you know, and a little knock-kneed, and she landed, and her knees went together, and her leg caved in. And thankfully, one of the other pediatric sports medicine doctors saw her and realized that she had a tear right off the bone, which I can repair. He sent her to me. And we repaired her last week, and I saw her today. She's five days post-op. She has no pain whatsoever. She took pain meds for one day. She has 90 degrees range of motion, and she's walking uh, with no limp. So that's a lot different than your standard ACL reconstruction. So we saw a variety of patients today, anywhere from 
15 or 16, all the way up to 54, a patient who was a skier. And she was, uh, she was skiing and caught her foot in the heavy snow. Her knee popped, and she's seen two or three other doctors who all told her that first couple of them said that you're too old to have surgery. Just leave it, and you'll be fine. And she said, but I'm active. I want to ski. I want to do all these things. I don't just want to leave it. And then she saw another surgeon who said, well, then you're going to have to have a reconstruction. And then she heard about my repair surgery and came to see me, and she was a perfect candidate. She tore it right off the bone. It happened about five days ago, and we'll have her probably jogging before she even got into the operating room with the other surgeon. And talk about the pain meds and the process, because the surgery, the reconstruction is just so hard in the body. Oh, yeah. Everybody knows in this country that we've got a big problem with addiction and heroin use and heroin overdoses. And the scary part of it is, is a lot of it comes from the entrance into using those types of uh, drugs are pain medicines that came from surgery. And I think that the doctors were probably too flippant about administering too much pain meds for quite a while. And I think this big problem arose, and now we're trying to reel it in. One of the nice things about my repair surgery is that the majority of my patients are off of pain meds within one to two days. They have full range of motion within a week, and most of them can run within four to six weeks. It's incredible. When I tell people this, Every, all the athletes, they just like, you, you must be kidding. You cannot be serious. And I get emails constantly from physical therapists who've been doing this for 25 years, including pro athletes, and they've never seen anything like it. And so I've been doing this for eight years now. I've done almost 100 primary repairs. We're running at well over 90% success rate. And um, I'm pretty much used to it. So how come it is, isn't be the norm? How come more and more people, what's standing in the way? Well, as you know, change is hard, and we've got, we're sitting on a situation here where three generations of orthopedic surgeons have been trained as their dogma that the ACL cannot heal. So basically, I'm going against the Bible. Now, is there, do you have to be retrained? <laughs> do you have to be retrained? To no, learn it's, it's to not. Say? You have to open your mind to believe that Maybe there could be a different way. Maybe they were mistaken. I mean, I, I joke around. I have a thousand ways to talk about this. I mean, we listened to 8-track tapes back in the 70s, and they weren't the best thing in the world, but we didn't give up on music. Right. We didn't just stop listening right. to music, right? We, we, we evolved. And the trouble is, is when they gave up on ACL repair, the thought process about possibly repairing that ligament went extinct. It didn't just continue to evolve slowly, it went extinct. And no one has talked about it for the past 30 years, except for Martha Murray in Boston, who's been trying to develop another technique. She uses a little sponge that she stitches in between the ends of the ligament, and she's in early clinical trials on that. But mine is really just based on the healing ability of the body. And if you have a certain tear type, you can heal that tear type. It won't work for the ones that are in the middle. You, it works for the ones that are up high. But like I said, 30 to 40% of patients have a tear that, that's potentially repairable. I feel at this point it's like almost irresponsible for the doctors to not at least put it on the table and make, let the patient pay. Well, remember, you got, look, I, I would never say that. Each doctor can only do what they know and what they've been trained and, and what they're good at. They can't offer a patient some crazy newfangled surgery that they've never done before and say that they're going to have good results. But you do both the reconstruction and the repair. Oh, absolutely. So what happened was, and it's kind of an interesting way it evolved, is I started doing the repairs and for years you know, I would do one occasionally and I saw how unbelievably well these patients were doing. But mind you, the numbers weren't very big. I told you it took me four years to collect my first 11 patients, right? And what I happened was I started getting frustrated because the repair patients would do so well, it was almost shocking. In fact, it was shocking. But then I would do a reconstruction and the patients would lag so far behind the ACL repair patients that I was getting frustrated. So when I would go into the knee, I would see a ligament that was perhaps, you know, I thought was going to be right on the bone, but it wasn't really going to reach the bone. And I would get I would be nervous about trying to repair one that wouldn't reach. So I developed a procedure. Rather than chop the rest of the ligament out, I developed a procedure to complement the repair, which was is called an augmentation, a repair and augmentation. Now, many more doctors have tried to augment the torn tissue. And that, that concept, none of these concepts are new. These are just new takes on them. For a third of my patients, I can repair it with a simple small surgery. 
And the next third of my patients, I can repair it close to the bone, but I usually add a very small graft just to give it a little strut in there. That's called an augment, what I also call the medium surgery. And then for less than a third of my patients, will I have to resort to the standard reconstruction that everybody else does. So for two-thirds to three-quarters of my patients today, if you walk in, I can repair most or all of your ligament and avoid the big reconstruction that is the standard procedure across the world. Now, what about insurance companies? Do they... Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny there. We place little codes for each different procedure. And the, the code that's used for this ACL reconstruction, if you actually read the code, it's coded for repair versus augment versus reconstruction. But that code was de designed 30 years ago, back when they used to do it, and it didn't work. But now we can do it, and it does work because we know who to do it on. Okay, so what's the difference in the cost? It would seem that the repair is so much more cost-effective and easier. We haven't done the cost-effective analysis yet because the numbers haven't been big enough. But as you go on, it's intuitive that if you require therapy for less, you use less right. pain medicines, you get better faster, then of course it's going to cost less overall in the big scheme of things. And know? the person's put under is the same pain meds to do the surgery itself? Yeah, that, that part's all change. standard. Although I have to use less pain meds because the surgery is much, much, much quicker. And, you know, we've, I've also recently done a study looking at the 90-day experience of my patients of, I think it was 50 ACL repairs versus 50 ACL reconstructions. So I compared the three-month experience to try and put on paper what I know is true, that they get better faster, they get their range of motion at the first post-op visit, increase more range of motion on average. They get their full range of motion faster, almost a month faster than the reconstructions. They have less complications and the surgery is quicker. Now, you know, my average time that it takes is roughly around 30 to 45 minutes. So in the same time, it, oftentimes it takes the surgeon to harvest the graft to do the reconstruction. I'm already done repairing it. What type of advice do you give anyone who's been through the repair or the reconstruction? Because I feel like a lot of the mistakes are made either right after where they come back too soon or they're not listening to the doctor like what's what's the advice you give repair reconstruction so if anyone's listening has had it or is thinking about having it yeah. so look the re the reconstruction like we talked about before the big issue with the reconstruction is it knocks you down so far the morbidity of the procedure or the damage to the patient is pretty significant and it takes you a long time until you're moving well so for the reconstructions, it's being patient and waiting until you're moving well and that you're not putting yourself in danger. Now, it takes probably six, nine months for that graft to kind of get scarred in real good and become strong, but it may take that or longer until your quad is back and you're actually moving in a safe, kinetic way, right? Now, the trouble with the ACL repairs is just the opposite. The people feel so good so fast that most people come in and after a couple of weeks, they're like, Doc, I feel like I never was injured. Because think about it. I've done a very small surgery with a couple little poke holes in your knee. I've tacked the ligament back. And anyone who ever tore their ACL and waited a while to, to have their surgery knows that at about a month, you felt normal. Your knee was wobbly, but you felt normal. With my surgery, now your knee's not wobbly and you feel normal. That, that wobbly feeling is the worst. That's yeah. actually worse than the pain. That you, at any point, you can feel it. Just ready to ready go. To go. Yeah. Well, what, what advice would you give then someone to who may worry about doing the other knee? Or how, how do you then... Yeah, that's a little trickier, is to predict why people are tearing the other knees. I actually have two patients who had the repair, were doing awesome, and then nine months later tore the other. So I think do think there's a bit of probably a bit of genetic predisposition. I mentioned to you about the study from Canada where they took 118-year-old female soccer players, 18 and under, and they looked at them and followed them for two years. And within two years, a third of the, of the patients had either torn the, the operative knee again or torn the other knee. Right. So there's something to it. It happens more frequently in females than, than males. And we haven't quite got our finger on exactly what the story is. My feeling is, is when you have the big reconstruction, you're favoring the other knee so much that you put that other knee at risk. 
Now, we, I did, like I just said, I had two patients who've undergone repairs on both knees. So that kind of challenges my theory of, of favoring the opposite knee because they both recovered extremely quickly with the repair. Both are pretty tall, lanky kids, and may, that may have something to do with it. But it, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what the answer is. And there's been a lot of effort and a lot of study into why people are predisposed and we haven't come up with a great answer. Well, I, I do think it's, it's hard to tell any athlete to be patient because they may think that they're ready. And there's many cases where they've psyched themselves into being ready and their, their quads don't look the same. They, yeah, they clearly, exactly. they want it so badly to think that they're ready and get back, but their body is not ready to go back. Yeah. So it's how do you tell an athlete to, to slow down and be patient? So it's, it's amazing, you know, with, with my experience, it's not so hard when you're doing reconstructions because the kids realize like, look at my leg. It's like a little chicken leg compared to the other one. And they know that like, oh, I'm not going through that again because they just went through hell, right? But with the repair, that's a whole different story. And I've got a lot of young people coming to me now and they feel they have full range of motion, no swelling, and they feel completely normal by two weeks post-op. And now at six weeks, they're asking me if they can play soccer. And I'm like, whoa, slow down. You know, we're not doing that. And then by three months, when they ask me again, they've felt normal for two months now, or two and a half months. So it's getting harder and harder to hold them back. Right. So, you know, I've gotten to the point where I'll try desperately to hold the, the females back because they have the highest risk uh, until at least six months. But almost everyone is back to playing by six months. And like I said, thus far, we've only had a handful of uh, failures, which were all re-injuries like a year and a half out. We had one of the early ones went back to play tackle football at three months, rugby at four months, soccer, lacrosse, five, six months. We have one girl who was a uh, nationally competitive cheerleader you know those uh ones where they have the big groups of cheerleaders and they do all the organized you know competitive uh, cheer moves where they're throwing the kids up in the air doing the it's aerials the most dangerous sport it's unbelievable and they're doing the back handsprings and so she was the girl who did the final back handspring run and stuck it to in the national competition anyways at three months she came into my office and did a backflip and i'm like oh my gosh and she's like doc i'm going back she sent me a video of her doing back handsprings at four months and sent me a picture of herself where they, her team came in second in the national cheer competition at uh, like four and a half months post ACL. And she was the girl who did the tumbling run to stick it to win. And so she's about a year out now and she's been tumbling since um, like three or four months post-op. And she should be your poster girl for this. She's really, yeah, she is. It's unbelievable. Now, I've tried to put a lot more uh, stuff online. You can go to YouTube and, and search Gregory S. D. Felice, MD, and you'll come up with a YouTube channel dedicated to ACL repair. And there's a bunch of patient testimonials. There's a bunch of lectures on there where you can listen to me lecturing to, you know, rooms full of orthopedic surgeons, trying to explain to them why I think that we gave up ACL repair for the wrong reasons and that why we should do it, how I do it. And what my outcomes are, you can hear, you can see patients, uh, you know, news pieces from TV and radio and a bunch of lectures. You can follow it all the way through for the past four years and see as my data and my uh, studies have gotten more and more uh, follow up. Okay. So it's and exciting. Just for clarity, the ones that failed were the athletes who went back, were they hitting the knee or oh, why yeah, did they yeah. fail? So we've had five patients fail and we're just, we're really close to a hundred now. So let, around 5% or 6% of folks have failed. We had one patient who was about 36 or so. He was walking down the stairs at three months. It was one of my like first five and he felt a pop in his knee and then his knee loosened up. And you know, when I think back about it, that was when we were. I was first figuring out how to do it. It might be that we tacked the ACL in a slightly wrong position and it was seeing too much tension and it just kind of failed on him. And he elected to just live with it. We had another guy who was about 42. I think he was a soccer player, recreational soccer. And he was, uh, there was a big ice storm and he slipped. And he was about 10 months out and just went, uh, you know, head over heels and cranked his knee. He tore it and he just elected to live with it. And then we had uh, two or three young girls. They were a year and a half out or so playing soccer and rugby and uh, lacrosse, I believe it was, and who just got caught up in a big, huge tackle and injured it. That's not great. But the great thing is, 
is if you went for the repair as the first surgery and it, it happens to fail, you can always go back and do the reconstruction as your bailout, right? So you're not playing your trump card as your first play. That's probably the best thing of all, and especially for the young people. If I'm saying, and the, and the world's finding out that people under age 21 have almost a 20% failure rate, and that's with the big surgery, why wouldn't you want to do the little surgery and see if you were in one of the 90% who did well with that surgery so you can avoid the big surgery and save that one as your trump card or your, your bailout if you need to, right? The trouble is, is if you play your trump card and do the big surgery first and then that one doesn't work, now you have to have an even bigger surgery. And I've seen multiple patients in my office who come in and they're in their early 30s who've had three ACL reconstructions and now they have arthritis. And they're probably not going to make it till they're 40 before they need a knee replacement. So one of the huge upsides of the repair is you don't burn it, you don't burn any bridges. We're right. not drilling tunnels. We're not taking grafts. We're not doing big long surgery with huge recoveries. We're just going in with very limited incisions and tacking your native tissue right back to the bone. Mm -hmm. If it heals, jackpot. You win. Awesome. Move on with your life. If it happens to fail, all right. So didn't work with the little one. We got to do the big one. But if we, according to my estimates, between the studies that I've done on MRI that shows, tells me exactly how many t uh, of each different tear type there is, and then I've also done studies that look at, given that tear type, how many times can I repair it? So we've done all these studies, and if you calculate out based upon, in America, there's about 300,000 ACL tears per year. You can calculate out that about 80,000 patients per year in America could potentially have my small surgery and avoid the big one. That's a big deal. You know what the crazy thing is? If, and I think about this all the time. Is, you know, I was, uh, like I said, I, I'm a college athlete. I, I played, uh, I, I got into rugby afterwards and I played kind of national level rugby until I was like 38 for the New York Athletic Club. And uh, I ski, I had basketball, I was a catcher. I did so. I played sports all my life. And if I had gotten into line with all of my compatriots who wanted to be the team doctor of this pro team or that college team, and I immediately got in line to do that, I probably never would have had the experience that I had taking care of all those trauma patients that led me to try and come up with a new way of doing things. So if I had gone the standard way, taking care of all the athletes, I never would have thought of this because the athletes tend not to come in with these horrific injuries that made me think outside the box. And now that I'm back uh, here at the hospital for special surgery and I've got more of a private practice, I'm seeing more of the athletic population, I can apply all of that, that experience to everyone, whether you're a recreational athlete or, you know, high school athlete, college, etc. I don't see, a, you know, a lot of pro athletes because they tend to be herded by the pro team doctors and the and you know there's always a team doctor for each college etc cetera, etc cetera. but certainly the best outcomes that i have are in the best athletes so the young rugby player who's chiseled out of stone gets better instantaneously and you know i went back and played rugby at four months post op full contact and he's now five and a half years out on a, a national level and so the thing that's interesting is, you know, what happens if you're a collegiate athlete and you tear and you're a junior and you want to play in your senior year? Do you redshirt? Do you wait out? Or if you got your one chance left, do you just try and repair it and, and see if you can play? What if you're a pro athlete at the end of your career or whatnot, or you know that, the, that you're a professional athlete and you're kind of on the cusp and you tear your ACL and you're going to get dropped? Believe you know? me, I know. I, I, if I had signed at Northwestern. You would be if here I hadn't in a second. Signed, if I hadn't signed at Northwestern on November 4th or whatever it was, and I blew it out December 27th, had I blown it out September 27th, I don't know if I'd be here right now because back then they just wrote you off. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I feel like if you're at the end of your contract or you're on a great team and you blow it out and you want to return and be a national champion or world champion and there's that window of time and I would try this. Yeah, yeah, right. What do you have to lose? I mean, listen, it, like I said to you, uh, one of the first 11 I did was a young kid who tore it playing rugby in May. He was in Ireland on a tour playing rugby, 
and he tore it. He felt it go. He went to see a doctor. He was all teed up to get his reconstruction done. And then somebody told him to come see me because of the rugby connection. And I saw him and we did surgery on June 1st. And then he rehabbed incredibly quickly. And in August, I think it was August 1st, he was squatting two, 300 pounds. And he, he said to me, Doc, by the way, I'm going to play football September. It's my senior year football season. And I'm playing and I don't care what you say. And I said, yeah, okay, I guess uh, you're going to play. There's not a lot I can say about it. And to be honest, I was a high school football player, and I was the captain of my team my senior year. I probably would have done the same thing. Because when we tested him, I was trying to find reasons not to let him play. And I said, well, oh, come on, let me show you how weak your leg is. So we put him in the testing machine, and his leg was stronger than the other one. I'm like, are you kidding me? And then we made him run around and do all these zigzags, and he was moving like nothing ever happened. And so he got back and played, started football September 1st and played the whole season. They won the city championships, and now he's five years later, and he's never looked back, and he's played rugby and all sorts of stuff. So the point is, is what about the pro athlete who goes down in August in training camp? You could potentially repair his knee, and he could potentially be back before the end of the season. So it opens up a whole new thought process. Now, everyone everyone's nerd. Oh, you can't do it on the high level athlete. No, that won't work. You know, oh my gosh, because everyone's so nervous. I'm not nervous at all. I've done it on over a hundred patients of all levels of athlete. And I know how well they do. They do awesome. You know, but the trouble is, is when you're the first one, everybody says you're crazy. Right. It takes a while, right. but eventually they, you know, if you, if what you're espousing works, then they say, oh, well, maybe he's not so crazy. So I can tell you, I've been lecturing about this topic for four years all over the world. And the first time I got on the podium, I could hear crickets in the audience. And I could literally, I thought I could hear people whispering, going, that guy's really crazy, right? Because the whole orthopedic community hadn't heard anything about ACL repair for 30 years. And it's been just this year now, it's not only me on the podium. Now, last time I went to a big meeting, now there were four guys on the podium talking about their experience with ACL repair. And now each time I go to give a lecture, I just got back from L.A. I was lecturing the uh, Kaiser Permanente group from Southern California, probably 150 orthopedic surgeons. And each of them was coming up to me telling me that they'd done, oh, I've done three, I've done five, one guy done 30. And so it's catching on. The great thing is, is it could potentially change the way we do knee surgery in the whole world. And think about all the athletes who don't have to suffer. That's the thing that gets me excited, right? You know what you went through. I know what I've seen people go through. Endless amounts of struggle. And we all have the athlete and the warrior mentality. And it's devastating to your mind to know that your knee's busted up. Heck, my 11-year-old son just tore his meniscus and had surgery. And I'm watching him go through it like a trooper. It literally makes me want to cry. How does the surgery affect the growth plate? You know, one of the big troubles when the when this really young kids tear their ACLs is that their bones are still growing. And the typical way that reconstruction is done, you drill holes up into the bones to place the graft, and you can injure the growth plate, thereby causing the bone to grow in a crooked manner. So that's a big, big worry, and there's been a lot of research done trying to find out ways to adjust the reconstruction technique to avoid the growth plates. One of my colleagues, or two of my colleagues here, Dr. Dr. Green and Dr. Cordasco, developed a, a special technique that appears very promising, and they've got some nice data on a what's called an all physial way of doing the surgery, meaning that they keep the, the tunnels within away from the growth plate. And that works pretty well in the really young kids. My feeling is, and I've got a, a bunch of, of uh, adolescent kids up into the teenage years, is that why even talk about reconstruction? We should absolutely be talking about whether we can try and repair the ligament before we ever talk about whether we're going to do a risky reconstruction. So, you know, I was just invited to write a book chapter in a pediatric sports text. So I think the message is kind of leaking out there and getting out to the uh, the pediatric orthopedic world is that maybe there's a, a group of the young ki of the kids who've been injured where we can actually just repair it and not reconstruct it. 
just like in the adults. But uh, with the kids, you get the benefit that you, you, you completely avoid the issue with the growth plate by re just reattaching the ligament and not having to drill any tunnels or do any grafts. So a major bonus for kids with the repair approach. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I say that in one of my lectures online, I say that this procedure, ACL primary repair, is, in, you know, incredibly promising. It's super exciting for athletes of all ages. But in reality, it's probably the most exciting for the kids who still have growing bones because we may be able to avoid the big surgery altogether. So that's uh, another added bonus to it for the young people. Look, they may not, I can't do 80,000 ACL surgeries a year, but the more people that walk into their doctor's office and say, how come you can't repair my ACL? They're going to start putting stress on the doctors and then they're going to start saying, why the heck is everybody asking about this? And then maybe they're going to get up and say, and look at the data and say, maybe there's something to this. And that's how it changes. And the doctors are very slow to change because they don't want to be willy-nilly and start doing something and then find out that they were wrong. Well, I've been doing it for eight years. I've been, you know, I, I've gone through the learning process. And then that's why I'm happy to share my data so that other doctors can learn from me. So to, to end, what do you think is your, your goal? Is there a metric with a certain amount of patients you want to have or how many doctors you want to see practicing your procedure within a certain amount of time? Do you have that type of metric in your head about what your future holds with regard to this surgery? Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have time to think about it that, on that big. I'm just trying to spread the word. Mm -hmm. You know, and share my experience, which is very, very different from everyone's experience because of the reasons I told you. I'm just trying to share it so that we can help more and more and more people. Like I said, and everybody asks me, oh, the first thing all the business guys ask me is, why don't you patent it? I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> it's, it's not about, like, becoming rich. It's about helping people, right? Isn't that why we went into this? Right. So it's about being an athlete and trying to help other athletes so they can have as much fun as I did playing sport and not have to worry that their knee's blown and that, you know, and that they spent half their life gimping around because of all these big surgeries they've had. That's the point is so we can move the ball down the field and make it better for everyone. So the metric I want is that, yeah, other guys, that I, we start a worldwide dialogue amongst the doctors and each person, once we start talking about it and saying maybe this is true, each person's going to add their own twist to it with their own experience, and they're going to slowly make it better, and it will help everyone. And so that's just the surgical side. You know, the other part of it is all the prevention side. And you know, here at the hospital for special surgery, working with a, a, a big team of people, and uh, Joe Janoski's uh, one of the leads on this. Is they've started a big program and trying to coach the coaches and coach the teams and stuff how to train the players to avoid acl injury ultimately that's what you really want is to so we don't even have the surgeon we want to put the surgeons out of business right and well, I, the, i'm good with that right i we teach it in our workouts we do dynamic stretching warm-up and we teach the kids to do it on their own because we tell them not to rely on their high school coach to remember to do it every practice oh yeah so that's an even bigger topic is trying to get the message out on how to train everyone so that they know the stuff, the warm-ups that they need to do so that they're moving in a more functional way and they can avoid that kind of knock knee where you cave in your leg and you, you pop your ACL. Well, I definitely want to come back and do another one on that because we're constantly doing in our workouts and we want to also want to be able to send homework home with the kids over the oh, summer. Yeah. We can totally set you up with that. Like I said, Joe Janoski is, is the point person on the big program that we've started here right. at the Hospital for Special Surgery that we're really trying to get off the ground. Like I said, I'd love it if we can put the surgeons out of business. That'd be great because <laughs> nobody needs to go through this stuff. No, it's tough. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. For more information on the ACL repair surgery, or to reach Dr. Gregory D. Felice, check out the show notes that include his office number at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. You can also visit his website, gregorydifelicemd.com. You can also see his YouTube channel with testimonials about the surgery. Thank you for listening to the MoMotion podcast. Be sure to subscribe, tell friends, rate the show, and send your feedback so we can up our game and bring helpful information to parents, coaches, and young athletes.